Um. Thumbs up? Oh, wow. <clears throat> now I'm like Darth Vader. Um, so my early technological career was uh, right in the beginning BASIC. Anyone here have a program in GW BASIC? Few? Okay. Ah, Matthew, didn't know that part about you. Um, C++ CGI's. Did anyone here ever write a CG, uh, CGI in C++? Okay. Wow. A lot. So I guess you can relate to my pain. Uh, the, the horrible early years. And command and control army systems, which I'm sure that there are probably not a lot of people in the audience that did that. And among other things, I also co-created PHP together with Rasmus Lerdorf and Andy Gutmans and co-founded Zend. Uh, before we get to mobile, I want to speak about some general PHP trends that uh, we're seeing happening today. This is information that we've gathered from uh, surveys that we've conducted over the last 18 months or so. <coughs> I think they're quite, quite interesting. Actually, before I go to them, maybe to get to know the audience a bit more, how many of you here are developers that develop uh, most of the time? Okay. Managers? Okay, so there's a fair bit of both. Um, okay, so I think it's going to be interesting for both of you. So uh, the first interesting point is here on the left. Um, this is very, very different from the early years. In the early years, PHP was found primarily in websites, internet-facing websites. It wasn't that popular inside the firewall for creating corporate apps, mainly because it in the, in the early years, it didn't really exist inside large uh, enterprises. People, the, the, um, companies didn't let it in from the front door. But this is changing. Uh, it's changing both from the ground up, from uh, developers embracing PHP, whether management wants it or not. But also, in recent years, it's also happening top down. And we're seeing quite a lot of companies, including very, very big ones, that have embraced PHP as one of the solutions typically in a large company, there's not just one solution, there's several. But PHP has become one of the key solutions that uh, they're using, both for external-facing applications, for websites, and internal-facing uh, applications in the what we used to call the internet, um, corporate applications for internal use. Um, the vast majority of PHP applications is developed not as a hobby, but for business-critical reasons, 25% uh, for internal uh, critical applications, 14% per external critical, 25% probably also most of them also external, revenue generating. Assuming that you're not selling inside the company, then most of the revenue generating ones should be uh, external. So 60, over 60% 60 of the PHP applications uh, are for business critical use. And I guess I'm not saying anything that is new to you, but uh, there used to be for many years, and even in some small pockets today, the notion that PHP is not some sort of a toy language, uh, that you don't use it for real projects, for real applications, for stuff that is critical, nothing could be farther from the truth. It's, uh, it's the exact opposite. Um, and the last uh, interesting piece of uh, information on that slide is that... Uh, uh, Gate number of developers is, uh, are using PHP for deploying applications to the cloud. Um, cloud is a bit of a buzzword. It's not a, a well-defined technology term. But uh, I think it's, it's a first statement to say that in the last uh, two years and maybe even a more rapid pace in the last year, deploying to the cloud and deploying to uh, cloud services whether it's on Amazon for production or on OpenShift for creating uh, some simple apps or, or the Zen Developer Cloud has become much, much more popular than it used to be. How many people here ever deployed an application to a cloud? I'll, I'll let you define what a cloud is, but... Uh, okay. So, that, that definitely is not uh, corresponding to that figure, but interestingly... Um, Apparently, the situation in Europe is quite different from, from, from the U.S., uh, both due to regulations, but primarily due to regulations. I think that companies here are pretty much not allowed to take information outside uh, of the country. So it's not as popular here as, as it is uh, overseas, 
but I think that will change. I mean, there's going to be more and more cloud vendors which are local, uh, and even um, uh, overseas cloud vendors will find solutions, perhaps open sites in, in France, in the European Union, uh, and, and sort out that issue. But for now, there is a bit of a gap. Um, that's uh, another survey that we've conducted, which is quite interesting. We've asked uh, mostly decision makers in, in large companies that use Large companies, um, as I mentioned, almost always use more than one technology. They never, almost never standardize on one technology. So we asked them to uh, identify the next most popular or most used language in their company um, and compare PHP against it. So all of them are using PHP. That's why we asked them. But uh, we, we did ask them, to, to figure out what the second or either second or first most po popular language was and compare PHP against it. Um, and not surprisingly, uh, what we're seeing is that 88% of the respondents said that uh, PHP uh, shines at speed of development. That used to be from the get-go the, the main advantage of PHP. And that's, uh, th that's a good indication that we're not just saying that and it's actually true that they're saying it as well. Ease of development and working with the cloud, I guess, less, impo less important for that audience. Maybe I should ask, how many of you intend to work with the cloud in the future? Okay, that's a bit more. I, I, I hope that next year that I come here, it will be even more. Um, the, um, the, the complexity of training new developers and diving into the language, also a key advantage. 80% uh, of the respondents saying that it's significantly easier to amp up developers on PHP than it is on the other most used language. It's not the, you know, the worst language. It's the other most used language in the company. So that's pretty good. Security is a nice, even, more or less 50-50. A bit uh, more than 50% say that PHP is better in security than the other uh, solution. Now, it's not as, you know, not as good as the other factors, but um, I, I think it's fair. I don't think that PHP is significantly better at security compared to other solutions. But unlike uh, previous years, um, we're not seeing that perception that PHP is much worse because it was really a perception that I think PHP received in a completely undeserved manner, um, and I, I'm happy to see that it's changing. So I'm actually going to get to the topic of my presentation, mobile. I'm using that just as a clock, not uh, as a mobile phone right now. See how I'm doing. Um, that used to be my phone. Not too long ago. That's uh, just over two years ago. Um, it's a Nokia. I still have it. It still works. Uh, it will probably still work in 10 years from now. But it was not a very advanced phone. I mean, it was useful, I could make calls, I could receive calls, uh, I could even browse the web over WAP, but not, not good, not, not good for that. It was really a phone and nothing, oh, and there were some games on it, I think Snake was still on it. Um, and the following month, that was my phone, and I still have it today, it's the same one. Um, and I remember when I got it, uh, I think I spent something like three nights, because uh, in the day you need to work, but three nights to set it up. Now, there's not a lot, lot of things you can set up with an iPhone, right? You can't really hack it. I didn't jailbreak it. But I installed a lot of apps. I configured it. I configured it so that I can access, it, uh, access my computers, my home computers from remote. Uh, all sorts of things, SSH, uh, video conferencing, all that stuff. I, I spent something like three nights to, to get it all set up. And a couple of weeks later, I actually went here, not here, but to, to France, to Paris, and I, I visited uh, a European city for the first time with a smartphone, a real smartphone. And I remember it radically changed the experience. I was with my wife in Paris, and uh, she wasn't too happy about it because like half of the time I was stuck in my cell phone, trying to take advantage of all of the features it can give me, like whether here was the best patisserie, was the best... Uh, and so on and so forth. But it was a completely different experience. I didn't get lost in the metro even once because there was an app that uh, you know, told me exactly which, uh, train, which trains to take and where to switch. Uh, Google Maps, back when the iPhone still had them, uh, was really good. It's not as good now with Apple Maps, but uh, still. And 
it, it was a radically different experience. And surprise, surprise, I wasn't alone. I think that uh, the world over the last couple of years has gone through really evolution. It didn't start when I switched. It started a bit before. Uh, I was a bit late for it. But I think that today we really, not at the peak, but it's already like a fire that uh, took hold and you, you can't really stop it. Uh, those devices are becoming more important. I'm not just talking about iPhones, but Androids and Windows phones and all, all of the powerful, essentially powerful portable computers that you have in your pocket are really making those things look uh, a bit obsolete and like dinosaurs. We developers still need them, but uh, non-developers and people who are not typing a lot may not need them in the near future. I'm not sure that your parents will, will want, the next time they buy a computer, I'm not sure they will want one of those. They will probably want uh, a tablet. So uh, let's talk about this uh, from a technology perspective for a second. Uh, mobile 0.5, uh, if you want to call it that, uh, which was kind of like what my uh, Nokia was, um, essentially wasn't really any different from, uh, from those. It essentially had a phone that tried to pretend that it's a computer, uh, tried to browse the web. You had you know, pretty bad, but essentially HTML browsers, HTTP HTML browsers that uh, would connect and try to render the same web apps as you would on a desktop. Uh, and surprise, surprise, it didn't work all that well. Um, the the uh, devices were not powerful enough to enter those pages, and also in terms of uh, uh, the user interaction, it wasn't designed for such a small screen and, and no uh, pointing device, no mouse, and obviously no touch. Even when some websites, and most didn't, but even when some websites invested and created uh, mobile versions of the website uh, for WAP, uh, something you know, very basic, it wasn't quite that. I mean, you wouldn't, uh, if you wanted to check, uh, to, to go somewhere, uh, and you wanted to check on the web where it is, you would, before you left home, you would check on a computer, you would maybe even pin it out or write it down, and then you go. You, you were unlikely to rely on your mobile uh, when, when you get uh, out of the house. Um, fast forward to today, it's, it's very different today. I think that uh, we're not being futuristic by saying that to, uh, today you use uh, computers a lot less uh, for, for those kinds of tasks. Uh, actually, I just an hour ago, I went uh, outside here in Nantes uh, looking for a, a small store for um, um, children clothes, and I just left the hotel. I knew that it was somewhere here. I just left this uh, building, typed in in Google Maps uh, the, the name of the store, um, and it, it basically bought me there. So I, I didn't use the computer for, for that at all. In terms of the technology behind it, I would say that in most cases today, uh, you would use native apps. Um, I would love to use a native Google app if I had one. Um, and um, well, unfortunately, I, the, there is none to be found at this point. Um, and you, you would be using a, a native app to get the best experience. And uh, from a developer's perspective, that means that there are lots of devices that you need to support. Uh, today, I think between iOS and Android, you cover 80, 90% of the market. But it's probably not going to remain that way. I think that, in my opinion, Microsoft does stand a chance to uh, be successful with Windows Phone. Probably not as successful as iOS or Android in the near future. But at some point, you'll start to, ha to have to worry about it, uh, just like you have to worry about iOS and Android today. Um, and it appears in terms of the, develop, the developer activity on Windows Phone that it's only beginning to happen. So from two uh, very different platforms that you need to support today, it will be up to three. Quite a headache. And I'm not even talking about if you want to reach the full market, if you want to uh, support the BlackBerry operating system, uh, then it's in another one. But that's less important today, it seems. On the server side, which is what most of us are focusing on with PHP, typically when you want to support uh, a native app, this native app communicates with a, uh, a back-end system. It will be using uh, web services, 
one, one form, or, not, form on, or another of web services to communicate with the back end. And since most web applications uh, were written in a way that um, the uh, rendering of HTML was, even if it was separate from the logic, and not always was it separate from the logic, but even if it was, it would be still a, 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 a the same uh, integrated applications. It wouldn't be using services. So if you want to make your application available for a mobile device to, to interact, you need to create a layer of services, uh, unless you want to start passing HTML uh, in, in the mobile device, which is not a good idea. So what, pe what people and companies do today, they hack APIs on top or in parallel to the uh, web uh, applications so that they can serve data to the mobile devices. What we're expecting to happen, uh, and by the way, it's not really expectations, we're already seeing it happen, we're expecting to see it happening more and more, is that uh, companies and developers will employ a mobile-first approach. Because honestly, like I mentioned before, those mobile devices are becoming more important in, in, in most industries uh, than those devices. Uh, you really want to make sure that you're supporting people with a phone or a tablet, even before uh, you, you care about uh, the desktop experience. So what, what does mobile first mean? Context becomes very important. That machine here doesn't really know, I, I can, it's not exactly true, but it doesn't really know that I'm in Nant right now. It doesn't really have an idea of where, where I am. Uh, it could somehow, using Wi-Fi uh, and Internet addresses, figure more or less where it is, but it doesn't have a GPS. Uh, and uh, it knows much less about the surroundings compared to that small device here. So context, uh, being able to know when I look to the, I uh, can't remember the name of that uh, children's clothes store, but when I looked uh, up uh, th that, uh, the name of that uh, children's clothes store uh, on my mobile device, it didn't show me all of the different stores in France, it showed me the one in Nantes immediately. It knew where I was. So context is extremely important. Um, the interface is touch. It's not a keyboard. That is more important than uh, some people realize because it means that you need to think about the user interface and perhaps redesign it in a way that um, requires less typing, uh, perhaps more selection um, of, of multiple choices and less, less typing as much as possible. It's not that typing doesn't happen on these mobile devices. Of course, you have the keyboard, but... A keyboard is not as uh, easy to use on uh, mobile devices versus a computer. So as much as you can minimize typing, uh, the more you can minimize typing, the better. Um, users are now a much stronger part of your development uh, cycle. Um, pretty much every, I don't know about you, but pretty much every day when I uh, look at my phone, I, I have updates for applications. And they update very frequently. There's a lot of iterative development uh, compared to old applications, even old websites. And uh, that, the fact that uh, um, users today can comment and review your application in, in the various app stores, in the um, iOS app store or uh, Google Play or wherever, the fact that they can review the app and uh, give you feedback about it, and you can act on it quickly and very easily um, create a, a new version, and the user in turn can upgrade very, very easily, those things, those things are all pretty new. Not completely unique to mobile, but this whole integrated experience of users into your workflow is, um, is, is new. And it also forces companies and developers to work in a more agile way. You can't really, uh, well, you can, but it's probably not a good idea to release and update your application once a year. You need to be more agile, more iterative, and release updates probably every, every few weeks, if not more frequent. And um, um, the, the last thing is that the reach of those applications is much higher than before in, in two ways. First, I think that those mobile devices are more accessible to a larger number of people than computers were. The user interface is simpler, and people, uh, old people and even and young people who are unlikely to use a computer 
are likely to be using a mobile device and a, an intuitive application. The other part of that is that people are connected all the time. And in terms of um, performance and scale, um, there's probably a lot more, if you have a, a popular application, there's probably a lot more load on the application than there used to be. Because beforehand, you need to be sitting near a computer in order to be using a web app. Now you could be in the middle of the street just uh, reaching for, for your pocket, taking out your phone, and there you go. You, you're using the web application. So the load is much higher. And you can't also uh, bank on you know, people, you know, people being at the office, uh, so I need to have more, more capacity at that time. Pe then people being at home, and then it's less important. You can't. People are connected all the time. Um, <laughs> So what we expect, how, how we expect it to influence the, the way that people develop, uh, develop applications, first on the server side, we would expect people to think uh, about mobile first and API first. The, the biggest change that you need to be thinking about uh, when, when you are designing your next uh, uh, version of the application or a new application, you have to be thinking about its APIs. You can't just be thinking about the functionality. You have to be thinking about how UIs, different UIs, even if you're starting with a web UI first, how would different UIs, like on a mobile device, uh, on a tablet, or even a TV, would be interacting with it? And how do you format your data into services and, um, and, and uh, functionality into services so that all different UIs will be able to interact with it? Um, on the server side, uh, we're also going to be, you should also be thinking about how you integrate it with social elements and other elements that people uh, expect today. People don't expect uh, to, to have to register to a website. They want to be able to log in with a Facebook account or a Twitter account. So th those are things that, um, fortunately, um, frameworks for PHP already make it very, very easy for you to do, but those are things that you should be thinking about that you may not have necessarily thought about before. And like I just mentioned, you need to be thinking about scaling because if, uh, God forbid, your application becomes popular, scaling is going to be more important than it used to be because people, again, can, can be using this application the whole time. On the client side, even though uh, today... Uh, there's a lot of native application development going on. We're also seeing a lot of HTML5 uh, and JavaScript development happening, and uh, we, we expect it that in the long run, HTML5 slash JavaScript development is going to win on the mobile devices because supporting so many different mobile devices is going to be too much of a headache. It's not going to win for everything. Uh, I don't think that Angry Birds is going to switch to HTML5 and JavaScript anytime soon. But for uh, the types of apps which are data-intensive and back-end-intensive, data-based apps, we think uh, that, um, that, that HTML5 and JavaScript on the client side are going to win. Now, I'm going to get to the uh, last part of the presentation, uh, and I'm going to show you some uh, beta software uh, it's even in between beta and alpha because it's not exactly the beta. We already made some improvements since then, but of course uh, quality uh, can regress a bit when you make improvements. The thing I want to tell you is that uh, even though I'm, I'm going to be talking about future products, those are not um, products uh, that we're going to release in the next couple of years uh, or that uh, we just have a theory or concept. Those are things that we intend to release over the next three months. So, future, but it, it's, pretty, it's pretty much around the corner. So, let's move on to the demo. That's my standard demo slide. Uh, I'm going to have to do some uh, setup. Because uh, I would want... Well, you know what, I'll, I'll begin without the setup and, and go, then go back. So, what, what we're seeing here is... Uh, the beta, alpha version, whatever you want to call it, of Studio 10. And I'm going to show you how uh, I can use it to create a mobile application that is portable, that can work on iOS, Android, and Windows Phone, um, and also include a bit of native experience into it. So let's start. 
I'm going to create a new, what you call a cloud-connected mobile project. We have two buzzwords in uh, one short sentence, but it is more or less uh, accurate. I'm creating essentially two projects. One is the client application, which is going to be installed on a device, and the other one is the server backend that is going to be serving with data. And I'm going to be installing it to a local virtual machine that I have here. Uh, okay, hold on. I need to get rid of the previous version that I have there. Okay. And I'm going to choose uh, an, a sample that is built into Zen, Zen Studio that uh, would get me started uh, showing what such a project more or less looks like, uh, just to save some time and get us started. So what it did, it created two projects for me. One is the client, like I mentioned. That's the one that gets installed on a phone uh, or a tablet. And the other one is the more common uh, P3 project, which is going to be implementing the server backend. Um, what I'm going to do without actually changing anything, I'm going to deploy uh, that uh, the server side into a PHP server that I have here, and uh, see, show you what it looks like. Now it's deploying it to my um, virtual machine. That is my virtual machine, in case you were wondering. Okay, now if all goes well, which rarely happens, but we'll try anyway, uh, when I run the client side, we're going to see some basic UI, uh, which uh, shows us the sample, of course, like I said, Stuff really works properly in the beginning. Uh, let me check some common issues. Yeah, okay. That is, I, I always fall for that uh, pitfall because it's on a VM. I have some weird uh, port forwarding going on. I need to, which studio is in the world, I need to uh, change the location of the, of the backend and run it again. Don't tell anyone, but this simulator here is based on Internet Explorer, and it has horrible caching issues, so I need to refresh. Okay, there we go. So what happened here is that simulator, which is just Internet Explorer, it's not all that interesting, it communicated with a, a service at the backend that I just deployed to, to PHP, and obtained a list of uh, users, of customers. Okay, we can also uh, try to get a look of what it looks like, um, what I call mobile server. So that, that's essentially the service. It's returning some JSON, uh, the list of customers. Okay, so very nice, but uh, how do we do something else other than just create a sample? <coughs> so the first thing I'm going to do is show you, let's see how the projector is doing today. Okay, uh, yesterday that, uh, pale blue part uh, was just not showing at all. It was completely white. So um, th That is a view of my services. I now have just one service, the one that I just showed you, get customers. I'm now going to add another one and show you how simple it is. So I'm going to uh, create an add customer uh, service. And I'm going to uh, go to the handler. Uh, it automatically generated this amazing handler for me. Uh, when I want to accept some arguments in this, uh, um, uh, for this service, well, the only thing I need to do is to add a couple of uh, arguments to it. And we're going to create a slightly creepy application where we track the location of your customers. Probably not something you want to do, but just for the sake of the demo. Um, Thankfully, I don't actually have to really implement it. I uh, actually have, uh, in the sample, I already have the add uh, method here, again, to save time. 
uh, and the completion here got it uh, right. I basically just pass on the arguments that I received from the service onto customer's data app. And then I save it. Um, so there we have it. We now have a new service uh, based on post that uh, is, uh, perform, should perform at customers. Let's test them. I'm going to uh, do a bit of testing to, sh to, to check if it actually works. Again, the ports here can be a bit annoying, but uh, I'll first uh, check the get customers. Okay, that's really small in, in this projector. But there we have it, we tested the get customers, the same thing that uh, I just showed you before, that, that's the one that was built in. Now let's uh, test the uh, post customers. You see it automatically detected that this service expects two uh, variables. So I'm going to say the location is none, none. Uh, my name is Zev. And I'm not going to press play, because first I need to actually save uh, or redeploy my application to the server, uh, move it to the uh, virtual machine again, which in this beta, I, it's not going to stay that way, but in this beta, what I actually need to do is uh, get rid of it and uh, deploy it from scratch. So I'm going to um, remove it from here. Um, there we go. I'm going to go back to studio. Make sure that everything is saved and deploy it again. Of course, you don't you don't have to use the deployment. You could also you know set up a, a remote server or copy the file in whichever way you want. Um, but uh, uh, right now I'm using the deployment mechanism of Zen Server. So not sure why it uh, forgot the information here, but it is a beta. So again, not still not found. Ah, yeah, the port. So many things that can go wrong. Okay, there we go. I now execute this brand new service, uh, and it tells it that Zev was added. Um, and what I'm going to do now, I'm going to go back to uh, the get uh, uh, the get service, and I want to see that it was really uh, that I was really added. And sure enough, I was. Okay, so I show up. Here uh, on the last uh, user, <coughs> last customer, the, the, the new service that I added works. Now uh, let's uh, see how we can connect it to the uh, mobile application. So we'll go back to the WYSIWYG view here. We're going to add a new page. Can you hear me, by the way? Even I put this and forgot to take it back. So, no, you can't hear me? You can't hear me? Okay, great. Uh, so, uh, I'll add a new page. I'll call it Add Customer. And I'll put some header on it. Uh, add Customer. I'm going to be nice and add a back button so that we can go back to the beginning, even give it a, a nice left arrow. Uh, and then a few text input fields. Uh, name, and give this one an ID, customer name, and customer location. And finally, a button that will actually drive all of this home, uh, that will add the the customer to the to, that will actually communicate with the service. Now, how do I do this linkage between the mobile application and the service? Uh, should be easy enough. Here, um, I have a list of p potential links. It, I can link it uh, to any page in this application, but I can also link it to any uh, service that is available uh, in in the mobile backend service. The one thing I need to do here is to give this uh, an ID and. Oops. Yeah, and then 
The only thing I need to do is create the linkage between the form elements and the uh, parameters that will be sent. So uh, first one is name, and it was named uh, the form was named cost name, and then there was location. It automatically generates some some JavaScript some Ajax that will communicate with the service. And if all goes well, uh, which again, like I said, it totally does, but if all goes well, then this uh, new page now uh, will be communicating with my new web service and adding a new customer. So I have just a couple of things I want to do. Let's fix the back button to actually work to come back to the index page. And last, we need to make this add customer page accessible. So I'll go back to the index page and add an a button that goes there, uh, put it here, uh, add, set up with a nice uh, plus sign, and oh, and we actually needed, needed to go to the add customer page. Okay, <clears throat> if I didn't make any mistakes, uh, then this should all now work, let's see. Again, Internet Explorer, <laughs> having to refresh. This is already sorted out in the latest build, but so get this works. I have the add button that I just added. It goes to this location, gate. I'm going to say, now I'm going to use uh, my, my full name, uh, and I'm going to pretend that I'm in Pez. Okay, going back. Surely enough, that didn't work. Very nice. Excellent. Uh, I know. I actually know why. Uh, I think I know why. And you will bear with me. I'm not going to explain. If you exp if you understand it yourself, then great. But I, I'm going to get rid of Internet Explorer in a second. Oh, there we go. Caching. So it actually did work. It just Internet Explorer got in the way. Um, so this whole Internet Explorer thing is very nice, but it's not really. You know, a mobile device. I'm going to try and show you now the same app in a slightly more realistic uh, mobile situation. First, I'm going to use um, uh, the Windows Phone SDK that I have here. I would love to show you an iOS version, but I can't on a Windows box. So, um, in order to now turn this amazing application into a real mobile application, I, will, I can create uh, mobile projects for the two, three different uh, supported operating systems. Um, you saw that that was pretty quick. I basically created now a, a connected project, which is a mobile, a Windows mobile project. And the only thing I need to do in order to uh, uh, run it in an emulator is to select an as Windows Phone application. Now it's building it and launching the Windows Phone emulator. You now actually have a package that you could dump on a Windows Phone. And anyone here with a Windows Phone, by the way? So you raise your hands for a second, okay. <laughs> okay, I think it's going to be a bit more popular next year. But it's this, if you were on a Mac, you get exactly the same integration with Xcode, and uh, you can create an iOS application uh, very quickly. And of course, with Android, you can do it in any um, operating system. It's just pretty slow, which is why I'm not using it. Uh, and there we go, we have now the same thing running. Uh, in IO, in a Windows Phone emulator, and you see that it's working in the more or less the same way, and it's actually slightly better in terms of caching. But Microsoft, in the infinite wisdom, doesn't let you use the keyboard. Uh, you have to use the on-screen keyboard with the mouse, which is really annoying. So uh, I say X Y Z. Uh, no. <coughs> Back, get list. Okay, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's not as good, not that uh, good with uh, uh, not better with caching. Anyway, it does work. Um, we should we should uh, be able to see it here if I'm right. Yeah, you see, it does work. But Microsoft and caching, kind of aggressive. We, we do have Pragma no cache in the latest build, but it's just not a build that I have. <laughs> So it did work, it's just not showing it to you. 
The last thing I want to do is to show you show to you on a real mobile device. And for that, I'm going to need some of you at least to cross your fingers because it's going to be a bit challenging. I'm going to turn on. I need the, this iPad to see that computer, uh, and for that, I'm going to open a personal hotspot on this mobile device. Uh, I'm going to connect to this uh, mobile device here <coughs> and also here. So those of you who follow me on Twitter, I did the same thing yesterday uh, and I didn't believe it to work. It did work, but perhaps today it means that it won't work, so <laughs> I hope that it will. Okay, and then... <coughs> wow, okay, that actually worked. So what you're seeing here is the same view as my iPad, okay? It's just uh, a bit easier to, to see, I hope. And um, yesterday, I, or two days ago, I asked uh, one of the studio developers who, who's on a Mac to build that same amazing application for me to build an RS package, and I installed it here. And this one is not connected to my VM. It's connected to the uh, to a Zen developer cloud instance that I have. But it's exactly the same thing, almost exactly the same thing as uh, I've shown you, and should be able to see that it works in the same way. First of all, now this is all with 3G, so it's pretty amazing that it works. Uh, same add button. Uh, will be nice to really give it the, the whole thing and add done go back okay dive that does a better job of caching <coughs> so uh, there we go it's exactly the same app you see that it's working fine on an iPad the very last thing I want to show you is how I create well, I created the button which is not really related but it's cool for a demo the take picture button which shows you that you can really integrate uh, this, uh, um, uh, those applications into native uh, features. Because we're using PhoneGap, I didn't mention that, but we're using PhoneGap, you can take a picture here. By the way, it's going to do absolutely nothing with it, so, uh, but you get, you get the point. Um, the same thing is going to work fine also on uh, an Android device and on a Windows mobile device. There's abstraction for it in, that you get out of PhoneGap. Um, by the way, in case you're wondering what you do with this picture afterwards, you see you get a file uh, and you can do whatever you want with it. For instance, you would probably want to have a new service that, a new upload service where you can upload that uh, file and connect it to the, to the user. Um, I want to show you uh, one last thing, how you actually uh, add this functionality and show you that it's really not very complicated. Um, at the end of the day, this is a JavaScript application, so the only thing we need to do is add a tiny bit of JavaScript that I did prepare ahead of time to save myself some timing, some typing. But we can go over it quickly, and you can see that it's very, very simple. Essentially, through PhoneGap, I get access to a native, uh, to native device features. Uh, in this case, a camera. You can also get access to an accelerometer and uh, location and so on. Sorry. And um, uh, you have a couple of callbacks, what happens in case of success, what happens in case of failure, and they're implemented here. The quality of the picture, and what were to save it, in this case in a file. And I'll save that uh, JavaScript file. I'll go back to my mobile app GUI, add a new button. Uh, I, I realize that I'm probably not the best UI designer. It's not a very beautiful UI. <laughs> Uh, or not very usable UI, but it's designed to get the point across, I hope. I'll add another button here that will trigger this uh, camera. Uh, okay, and I'll write a tiny bit of, uh, of uh, actual JavaScript and connect it to take and that's it. I'm done.
Now I have uh, uh, the take pick uh, method being called when I hit this button. Bit of refreshing <laughs> and oh, wait, wait a second. That that's a uh, that, that that won't work. I need to. That, that's a uh, Internet Explorer. Of course, it doesn't know how to take pictures, but the mobile emulator of um, of Windows Phone will kind of, not really, but we'll see in a second, will kind of show us uh, that it's time to take a picture. I was expecting, when I used it, I was expecting it to be connected to my webcam on the laptop. So, no. <laughs> it, it doesn't work, but uh, it, it gives you some sort of indication that it's working. Right? Wakey, wakey. Did I have a mistake in my JavaScript? Oh, not there. No. Oh, no, I just need to be patient. It's an emulator, right? So, take picture. There we go. You can take a beautiful blank white picture using the emulator. But uh, it gives you the UI of uh, Windows Phone, I guess. Right? This is more or less what it looks like, the, the Windows Phone person. That Windows Phone, that's uh, Windows Phone 7, so I don't know if uh, it's the same way. But you can see that the same idea is working. It's uh, showing me again where it saved it. So the, 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 the main point of this presentation, or well, this short demo, was to show that you can really create native applications or semi-native HTML5-based applications that are truly portable. Uh, I've shown you iOS and uh, Windows Phone, but it works fine on Android. Uh, just as well, um, and uh, still, uh, still in develop in one code base, and that that's a that's a big advantage on the client side and on the server side. I think uh, you also got a, a bit of a taste for how easy it is to create those services. Um, it's the, the services are based are, are actually one thing I didn't show is that the services are smarter than just. Uh, uh, being able to add or post, I could add validation to them. Uh, for instance, if I want to make sure that the uh, name uh, is uh, validated or filtered, I, I can do that. I can add a validator that will ensure that, uh, for instance, it's alphanumeric and not something else. Uh, and I could add a filter that will make it alphanumeric even if it isn't. All the, all the filters and validators that Zen Framework 2 exposes are available to you here. And you don't really need to write uh, any code in order to use them and implement those services. The only thing you, need, you still need to do, which we don't do, uh, do for you, is write the business logic. Fortunate thing. That, that you still need to do. Okay, uh, that was my presentation. Uh, thank you very much. If you have questions, uh, we have to take. We do support uh, JSON RPC with the Zen JSON server, but I don't believe that the Zen server gateway will support that out of the box. Uh, so I think, I think that the most fair answer is I don't know. Actually, in the process of rewriting, that, uh, that piece uh, that you just showed me, that piece of code is actually uh, written in a Okay, so uh, first question about performance. Um, it depends on what uh, platform. 
and it depends also on what, uh, what you're doing. Again, like I mentioned, I wouldn't use, be using the canvas and trying to implement uh, Angiebirds using uh, HTML5 on a mobile device. Specifically, Apple, uh, supposedly for security reasons, but in my opinion for political reasons, um, doesn't allow uh, applications which are other than Safari uh, to use the JIT engine. Uh, JIT engine, the, the really fast JavaScript engine. So that means that the application that you're seeing here, um, the mind that doesn't fall off, the application that you that you saw here, I guess I turned it off, um, was not running using JIT, and that means that it's not, it's about a third of the performance of Safari. So it's not ideal, but for those apps, I think you've seen it's, it's actually it's actually quite good. So for data intensive application, for data anti applications, for data crunching, that's uh, not data crunching on the client side, but applications that show you data crunching which is done on the server, th that is ideal. Uh, for things which are really CPU intensive, it's uh, HTML5 on a mobile is not quite there yet. I do expect it to get better. Uh, I think that. Um, that the situation, I think, and hope that the situation with Apple will change because with Android there's no such limitation. All apps can use the JIT engine, um, and at some point Apple will have to give up on, on, on that part of the strategy, but that's the way it is right now. Does that answer the question that whoever asked it? Can, uh, can we use the WebSocket also? Um, basically, you can use anything that the uh, JavaScript engine supports. So, assuming that all of your supported, uh, all of the devices you intend to support uh, have support for it, then, then yes, <coughs> any piece of JavaScript that you want. I'll see if there's any other questions here. Yeah. Yeah. In studio, you are making sure that the mobile application will have the same UI as a native one when deploying to more. Okay, uh, um, look, at the end of the day, this is HTML and uh, JavaScript. Uh, we, we do some, we're using it, uh, we, we've licensed a uh, technology named Codica for this uh, WYSIWYG UI uh, uh, creation, which does a decent job to tell you that it ensures that the UI will look the same. I, I can't quite tell you that. Uh, and uh, you saw that on an iPad, you know, it looks different. Uh, it looks more or less the same, but big. And you do have full access to JavaScript uh, uh, to, to develop um, any custom JavaScript that you want. So you could even um, intentionally make the application look slightly different on different mobile devices. Put some ifs or switch uh, over there, which would render differently depending on whether you're on a uh, tablet or a phone or whether you're on Android or, or an iPhone. But if you use it out of the box, it will it will make the application look pretty much the same, uh, except for when it's using native uh, native features like the camera, which you've seen looks very, very different across uh, different devices. Yeah. Uh, is, there, is there something functionality in uh, the Tensor 6 uh, related to uh, mobile uh, functionalities? Uh, to mobile functionalities per se, no. It's a uh, very uh, nice thing to get into Zen Studio in terms of the mobile development workflow with deployment, but uh, there isn't any Zen, there isn't any mobile specific feature in uh, Zen Server. It's much better designed for cloud and large, uh, and large clusters. Cluster um, manager. Hmm? Cluster manager. Actually, cluster manager is gone. Uh, <coughs> <laughs> there's, there's more or less an equivalent, but uh, you no longer have to have this one central piece that orchestrates the entire cluster. It's a much uh, simpler architecture. Uh,
I saw, I didn't really read the whole question, but I saw that someone was mentioning uh, flash filter for PHP. Um, flash filter for PHP is, is I think, uh, most of you uh, were, is, has been discontinued by Adobe, because Adobe kind of woke up and said, okay, flash is not going to win the mobile world, uh, and they're switching to HTML5 and, and JavaScript themselves. This time around, we decided not to take any chances and uh, focus on open, open standards and uh, HTML5 and JavaScript, which we believe are going to win in the long run. And um, in terms of widgets, um, there, there's a nice number of widgets right now here, uh, but um, there's going to be more. Uh, we're going to be adding them. This is what we have right now. Um, This view is collapsible things that you know, more advanced than what I've shown, but we're going to be adding more. One of the things that I'm really anxiously waiting for them to add is uh, a Google Maps uh, widget so that I can create my own Google Maps application. Right now, they do have a Google Map, but it's uh, static. Uh, where is it? It's somewhere here. Yeah, it's a map, but it's just a static map um, that shows you specific location. Uh, it's not the live one that you can do as well. Any other questions? Okay, yes. One thing about mobility is uh, one is uh, the end of page of uh, native application is, is, it came with preloaded data. Uh, are you planning to add a, a way to push data uh, when packaging uh, application with your to push data in, in, in one Maybe way. HTML5 uh, play on site data. Okay, so, so to, I, I'm trying to understand that the use case. Are you talking about like push notifications in like that or? Uh, you know, there are some data in your application which is not uh, live data. There are data, uh, I don't know, uh, pictures, uh, information. Okay, well. In big quantity. Well, it's essentially, you can put files in your project, and when you build it, uh, it's going to be included in your project. And, uh, and, and people actually do expect applications that they download. The delivery mechanism for those applications is the standard application store. So the, the Apple App Store, or Google Play, or Amazon, and so on. And people do expect the packages to, to include everything that they need. You can also use Using JavaScript, if you prefer to have a, a small application and have it download the, the information when it starts up, you can also pretty easily implement that as well. You, you have uh, access uh, to phone gap, you have access to uh, storage, and you can you know, download stuff and put it in storage. Both options are available. It actually reminds you that there's one other thing. Uh, back to your question, is there anything in Zen Server 6 that relates to that? Um, there's actually one thing that relates to mobile that can be quite uh, useful. Let's see if I can still get my iPad to uh, be shown here on the computer twice. It's not something I've ever tried before, so that would work. service-based application. We've made it significantly simpler in Studio 10 and Zen Server 6. I'm going to right-click the, the, this is the instance, this is the cloud instance that uh, the mobile application on this iPad is communicating with. I told you it's not, it's not using my virtual machine, it's using a cloud instance. If you right-click it and hit start the button, it's be patient since you tell me that it successfully did it. <laughs> or not. Okay, you've almost are successful. It, it is over 3G. <coughs> now what I'm going to show you is that yeah. now when I uh, hit get list, if all goes well, uh, 
nothing ever goes well, right? Sure. Sure. for that one, is, I guess, is too much. But um, if it was a slightly simpler setup and not uh, you know, an iPad connected to a, uh, a laptop over a 3G uh, uh, access point, virtual access point, then essentially what you can do is enable debug mode on the server and then any request coming in uh, will trigger a debug, a debug session. And you can also configure it so that not every request comes in, you can uh, perform a filter, but that makes the debugging workflow uh, much, much simpler than it used to be. So that's one thing that we did. By that. Voilà, je crois qu'on a fini euh, avec les questions. Euh, Ziv va partir vraiment très vite. Donc, euh, veulent... j'entends les applaudissements qui veulent commencer parce que, quand même, c'était pas mal. <rire> Voilà, et puis il y a l'équipe Zend qui peut aussi répondre à certaines questions, peut-être pas aussi techniques, mais qui sait. Voilà, bon appétit, je pense que les repas, c'est pour tout de suite. Hein.